2030, it sounds like years away, but the clock is ticking. Time is short and we have a promise to keep. A promise to ensure all people and communities in all countries receive the health services they need when and where they need them without facing financial hardship. But there's still a lot of work to do. At least half of the world's people lack full coverage for essential health services. More than 800 million people spend over 10% of their family budget on health services. And close to 100 million people are pushed into extreme poverty because of healthcare expenses. We cannot accept a world like that. We cannot afford a world like that. That's why countries all over the world are investing in universal health coverage by enabling communities to make decisions about their own health, like breastfeeding, healthy diets, and bed nets by reaching the most remote villages with life-saving services like vaccines, by building networks of affordable primary care clinics to provide treatment locally for everyday health needs, and by providing more sophisticated services at hospitals for life's ups and downs. The thing is, universal health coverage not only improves health and increases life expectancy, it also reduces poverty, creates jobs, drives inclusive economic growth, improves gender equality, and protects countries against epidemics. With investments, every nation can increase its range of health services, expand its health workforce, improve its infrastructure, ensure essential medicines are available, and protect people from the cost of paying for care out of their own pockets. We call on the global community to make universal health coverage a political priority so everyone can access quality health care without facing financial hardship. If we work together, we can make universal health coverage a reality and ensure a safer, fairer, and healthier world for all. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and welcome to this second plenary of this seminal meeting on universal health coverage. Um, my name is Sanya Nishtar and I have the honor of moderating the panel today. Um, we've all heard just now the inspiring words about universal health coverage and its potential to achieve the triple bottom line of human development, of social outcomes, of economic growth and of um, societal resilience and peace and security. Never has the political commitment towards universal health coverage been higher. We've heard from key development institutions who would now like to give more priority to human development and to health over infrastructure, and they're talking about some structural, fiscal, and monetary frameworks to enable that in a very tangible, time-bound way, and that is really auspicious. Um, we've heard from Prime Minister Abbey about the catalytic donor input towards universal health coverage, and it seems that um, universal health coverage, th there's a new life being in infused into universal health coverage, and they, this really is very auspicious. So just within this broader framework, just to build further on the first session, uh, the charge of our panel is to drill deeper to take stock of where we stand technically, to speak a little more about the new WHO report that has been launched uh, at this meeting on tracking progress. Uh, and in terms of format, I'll give the floor now to three colleagues from the World Bank at WHO who will build further on the presentation on the video that was just uh, shown. Subsequent to that, we will have a panel discussion uh, and then I will close. So I now would like to give the floor to a three-way coordinated presentation between Anias Sukhart, who is uh, the Director, Department of Health Systems Governance and Financing at the World Health uh, Organization, 
also a director but of the Department of Evidence, Information, and Research at the World Health Organization is John Grove, sitting next to her, who will join her in one segment of the presentation. And then Adam Wagstaff, who manages research at the World Bank Group, uh, will give his input um, on that presentation as well. You, you have the floor now. Thank you very much, uh, Sanya. Good morning to everybody, and uh, let me first express my uh, gratitude for the hospitality of the government of Japan, always uh, fantastic uh, uh, to be here, and also gratitude for your leadership in global health and your leadership on the, on the UHC agenda. So this morning, uh, we are presenting uh, the Tracking Universal Health Coverage 2017 Global Monitoring Report. Uh, this report has been prepared by a large uh, group of experts, uh, more than but 20, 20 experts, but we are here a choir of three to present it. The report is uh, the product of a collaboration uh, uh, from between the six WHO regional offices and, and WHO headquarters, together with the World Bank and uh, other partners, uh, particularly OECD and, and, and UNICEF. And the report is based on um, the framework uh, we are using uh, to measure progress on universal health coverage, which has three levels of action. Uh, first is in health system strengthening, which is what we do. And uh, by uh, investing in health system strengthening, but also in multi-sectoral action and addressing uh, the determinants of health, uh, we uh, contribute to universal health coverage, which is defined as all people and communities have access uh, to quality health care without financial hardship. And John is going to present uh, uh, um, the measurement of the service delivery uh, indicators and index, while Adam is going to present uh, the financial hardship uh, um, evidence. And by achieving universal health coverage, we contribute to achieving SDG 3, which is the health SDG, but not only. Universal health coverage also contributes to poverty reduction, SDG 1, and a, a lot of other NGGs, SDGs, including uh, education, social cohesion, because universal health coverage is a social contract in which uh, uh, um, there is a cross-subsidy between from, from rich to poor and from healthy to sick. And finally, universal health coverage contributes to economic growth uh, through uh, driving the health sector economy, creating jobs and creating economic outputs. So three dimensions uh, we're measuring, the, the UN universal health coverage cube. Um, first, uh, service coverage, everybody respective of their circumstances get the health services they need. Second, um, uh, financial hardship, financial protection uh, from hardship. Nobody suffers financial hardship as a result of getting needed health services. And finally, measuring equity. Uh, equity both in health coverage and uh, in financial hardship. Thanks. So let me hand this now to John. Well, thanks, Agnes, and good morning, everyone. Uh, and to those who were here uh, yesterday, some of this is uh, a bit of the same, but we're trying to keep it a little bit shorter. Um, I wanted to first say a word about the index itself. Um, the index that we use to look at service coverage is really an attempt to operationalize what is a pretty complex uh, set of things within one indicator. And so really the only way to tackle it is by developing an index. And so the values that are presented in the index really are just that, simply a number. They really are an invitation to look at what are the other factors across 16 tracer indicators within the index and to investigate further whether it's uh, low coverage in ANC or other areas. So it's, it's, a, it's a, um, an attempt to pull all of, those, all of those together through a set of tracers. And the point of departure for us uh, is that we need to look at data that is comparable across countries and regions. And so on the left-hand side, you can see that we assessed for data availability across the 16 tracers as at the year 2010. We actually found that 72% of those tracers had a fairly good amount of data. And what's interesting is the countries that benefited from 
routine uh, standardized household surveys over a long period of time on certain tracer indicators had more information than others. But it also revealed through the index that we have a lot of data gaps. And so we employed a number of proxies and other measures against NCDs, NCDs and the like where we don't have good treatment data. But we're hoping that the process of putting this index together will reveal those weaknesses, will reveal those areas where we need more measurement development and we will work on that in the future. In terms of the findings of the index, we see quite a broad range in terms of the values on the index all the way from 22 to uh, into the 80s. And we see the highest values in North America and East Asia and lower values in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. If we look at the data itself, one slice of the data, you'll see a lot of other information in the report. Also a paper that was issued in the Lancet uh, last night as well. We see across the, some of the tracers, there are nine where we could actually go all the way back into the 1990s. We're able to find that we had quite good positive trend. 20% increases across these nine tracers. And those of us who've been working on ITNs or HIV treatment expansion or immunization know just how hard it has been to scale up those services in the countries where we work. But at the same time, it's always important when we look at coverage data to look at the converse. What is the other side of the coin? And we still see gaps. We still see that we have one billion people living with uncontrolled hypertension. We still see that we have more than 200 million women lacking family planning. And we have 20 million infants lacking full immunization. And so that does cause us a moment of pause as well. And this suggests that really at least half the world's population don't have the essential services required. And you've heard that number reiterated throughout. So just to summarize, the index really is an opportunity for us to look at data availability, to us to look at the constructs of UHC, to look at what are the appropriate tracers, to build partnerships for methods development, and also to develop tools for strengthening data systems, data collection in the field that will improve our decision making as well as our practice in realization of UHC over time. So with that, I'll pass it to my colleague, Adam. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, so as Anya said uh, a few moments ago, universal health coverage is about ensuring that everybody gets the services they need without suffering financial hardship. Um, John's just told us about the progress on service coverage, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the progress um, or lack thereof on the financial protection side. Um, people getting care that they need without suffering financial hardship. There are a couple of indicators we use. Um, one is, do people spend more than 10% or 20%, 25% uh, of, of their total consumption on healthcare? Um, if we look at that number, um, we see 800 million people spending more than 10% of their total expenditure on health in 2010. And that trend is upwards. So you can see a fairly sharp increase here from 2000 to 2005, a somewhat smaller increase from 2005 to 2010, but the trend is definitely upwards. If we look at 25% as a threshold, we also see an upward trend. The different colors on this chart indicate the um, sh the breakdown across regions of the world, and you see a lot of blue here and also a lot of orange. Um, blue is Asia, um, orange is Africa. Um, that reflects to some degree the fact that these two regions of the world are very populous regions. This right-hand chart here gives you the rate of catastrophic payments, the percentage of the population that is spending more than 10% in this particular case. You see the region that actually has the highest rate is in fact Latin America and the Caribbean. And that rate went up over that first sub-period and then started going down over the second sub-period. The region that's seen a sustained reduction in the rate is in fact North America and the Caribbean. Now, a, a way to think about this catastrophic payment measure, as we call it, is if you have more than 10% of your total budget being spent on health care, that's like saying you saw a 10% or larger reduction in your living standards. Um, now, for some people, that's not a big deal. In absolute terms, 
we may be able to afford a 10% reduction in our living standards. The second indicator we look at, therefore, is actual financial hardship in absolute terms, impoverishment. So if we look at the absolute poverty line, $1.90 a day, 100 million people, we estimate, were impoverished by out-of-pocket spending in 2010. The good news is that if we focus on extreme poverty, that number is coming down. But if we put the poverty line a little bit higher, a line that might be more appropriate for, say, lower middle income countries rather than low income countries, the number is going up. And again, we see large amounts of blue in this chart reflecting the fact that um, Asia dominates the picture. Again, it's a reflection partly of the fact that the, those, that region is a populous region. If we look at the fraction of the population that are being impoverished by out-of-pocket spending, what we see is a, a, a downward trend in Asia and a somewhat flatter trend in sub-Saharan Africa um, and basically zero in the high-income countries. So for absolute poverty, we're not seeing major issues in, in the high-income countries, and we see some improvements in Asia and a lesser improvement in sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Agnes, John, and Adam, for a, for a very succinct and well-coordinated presentation. I'm sure the audience has a number of different follow-up questions, and I would encourage them to reach out to you during the coffee break. So thank you for joining us. I now have uh, the pleasure of... Um, inviting up on the stage our panelists. We, have, we will have five eminent panelists up on the stage. Uh, may I invite Minister Isaac Uduale, Minister of Health of Nigeria, <laughs> former Minister of Health of Japan, Mr. Yusuhisa Shiozaki, Ingrid Van Wees, uh, who's the Vice President of Finance and Risk Management at the Asian Development Bank. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Nazara Suhasil, Head of Fiscal Policy Management at the Ministry of Finance of Indonesia. <laughs> and finally, Mercedes Tatai, who's the International Medical Secretary at Médecins Sans Frontières. Thank you very much, and please give them a loud round of applause. So, so let me begin um, with you, uh, Minister Shiozaki. Um, you have been the Minister of Health, Labor, and Welfare in Japan for several years. Your leadership is well recognized. Uh, Japan was one of the first countries in the world to embrace universal health coverage. You are a, you know, you're a trailblazer in, the, in this area. What would be the three important lessons that you would share with countries aspiring to uh, embrace universal health coverage today? Well, first of all, I would like to uh, welcome all of you uh, uh, to this uh, USC uh, Forum in 2017. Uh, as a Minister of Health, Labor and Welfare, I, I, I was uh, preparing to and, will, uh, and try to welcome you, but uh, I, I, uh, now I'm, I'm the, the, the simple uh, diet member now. But uh, I do really appreciate for all of you coming to Tokyo. And uh, three lessons that uh, 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 Sanya uh, mentioned. Uh, we, we had uh, ASEAN plus Japan health ministers meeting in July. And uh, those ministers, well, I explained about uh, our lessons and experiences of uh, uh, universal health coverage uh, so far. Uh, they really appreciated the lessons mainly from the failures that I, we made. 
And uh, I want to talk about three lessons, one from success uh, experience, but two from failures. And the first lesson is uh, to start uh, investing for UHC in early stage, investing in early stage. In 1961, uh, when it was still in the early stage of uh, economic development in Japan, that was uh, a little before the Tokyo Olympic Games uh, in 1964, and the Japan gov Japanese government did, uh, provided national health insurance to cover all citizens left out from the then existing uh, employees' insurance in 1961. And also in order to strengthen human resource development and uh, provision of health care, the government launched one prefecture, one medical school uh, policy for 47 uh, prefectures in 1973. And uh, 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 I firmly believe that uh, uh, these early stage investments uh, for UHC were an important enab enabling factor in Japan's rapid economic uh, development later on. And uh, uh, second lesson is to adequately secure affordability of healthcare. And Japan introduced national health insurance in 1961, and this ensured affordability of fundamental health care. But let me uh, uh, remind you that out-of-pocket payment for health care should always be staged in on decline rather than the opposite. And in the case of early health care, in uh, elderly care, health care in Japan, we once introduced free user fee policy in 1973, and it took th some 30 years to uh, reintroduce a meaningful co-payment uh, uh, after a fierce political debate to raise this uh, uh, co-payment. So leaders uh, should note uh, that uh, uh, don't go the opposite way by increasing the burden on the, pa on the, on the general public. And the third lesson is to uh, plan for the demographic transition. And it took 25 years for Japan to double the aging rate from 7% to 14%. Uh, but we finally initiated a, a preparation process for introducing the long-term care insurance after the aging rate exceeded 14%. And consequently, sufficient time for preparing human resources with appropriate skills for long-term care was not available. Therefore, I would like to uh, uh, recommend uh, you to prepare for future demographic changes before the aging rate reaches two digits. Those are the three lessons that I would like to uh, com recommend to you. Well, these are profound, uh, profound learnings. I mean, you were very modest in saying we want to learn from our um, you know, your failures are your major learnings, I, I interpret it in a different way, that you basically plowed back evidence into refining the program. Um, so thank you so much for those profound insights. Minister uh, Isaac, d d do these things resonate with you? I mean, you've been such a champion of universal health coverage in your own country. Um, I, I, and also, le let me put some further granularity on my question. You know, universal health coverage is a social policy decision. It, is, is, it isn't largely a decision of a minister of health. So tell us your personal story of how you were able to navigate that space and whether the, whether the Japanese experience is relevant to your implementation experience as well. Thank you so much, Sonia. The, the Japanese experience is um, quite different from us because um, we are pulled apart in terms of resources, and in terms of advancement. But us actually um, took a different course. Um, when we came into office, we, we inherited a commitment from a previous administration that launched a presidential initiative on UAC in 2014. And when I was appointed a minister, the party that is in governance also had universal coverage as part of the manifesto. Earth for All was a clear mandate of the administration. And so with support from World Bank, UNICEF, WHO, and so on, 
I was able to put together a blueprint that would translate the agenda of the party into a workable solution. What also helped me was that the country was also preparing a blueprint for getting the country out of recession. That blueprint labeled economic recovery and growth plan had three pillars. One is to restore growth, two was to invest in the people, and three is to build a resilient and inclusive economic system. Apart from the three pillars, there are also two enablers. One is to improve governance and security. The second one is implementation and finance. When you look at all of this together, there can be no investment in the people than in health and education. And so it was so easy for us to key into the economic recovery and growth plan. And the key essentials of UHC was there. Expanding coverage for primary care, funding the system, building a robust referral system that will enable people to move from the community to the tertiary, and also investing in women and children. So in women and children. So to me, these are the essential ingredients. But the icing on the cake, which some people will call magnum opus, happened when the president personally flagged off the PAC agenda. The president personally, against the advice of some of his protocols, that the road was bad, he shouldn't go there, the president brushed aside those decisions and went to flag off the UAC agenda on January 10 this year. And that, to me, really marked a good beginning for Nigeria. And with support from the Global Financing Facility, will be kickstart the implementation of the Basic Air Care Provision Fund, which will offer free essential basic air care to Nigeria to 8 million people uh, by the first quarter of 2018. Well, thank you very much. It's, um, it's very interesting you, you say that you, the mandate was drawn from the manifesto itself and that your charge was to implement it. And then um, you refer to governance in particular. You know, in a number of different international frameworks, we see governance emerging as the bedrock framework on which universal health coverage should stand, effective governance that is. Um, in fact, the, the Ishishima initiative clearly alluded to the need for mobilizing all kinds of policy tools, structural, monetary, fiscal. There's a lot of emphasis on it on the sustainable development goal framework. I mean, a lot of international initiatives are focusing on the imperative to deal with corruption as uh, you know, in order to free up the fiscal space so that it's available for the social sectors and universal health coverage. Uh, you know, with, with that as, as, as a backdrop, uh, Mr. Nazara, I'd like to ask you, with your expertise in, in fiscal policy, how, how do you see these broader changes and how salient do you think these are for the drive towards universal health coverage? Uh, thanks, Sanya. Uh, in the Indonesian case, uh, our goal toward the universal health coverage was established back in 2014. So this is fairly new. And that was actually uh, by the mandate of a law that was uh, enacted 2004. So you see, 10 years passed before the actual government, even though it's already mandated by the law, but the actual government then created the National Health Insurance Scheme. And the National Insurance Scheme, which was effective 2014 has the universal health coverage mandate. And the mandate is to have the universal health coverage by 2019. Now, previously, in the Indonesian case, the poor is covered by the government program. And in 2014, we switched that. The poor now becoming the member of the national health insurance system, and the, the, the government paid their uh, premiums. So the, now the situation is that uh, we have to improve the membership. And as of last uh, month, the membership now is about 70%. Now, this requires strong government will uh, to continue to cover the, for the poor. And at the same time, the national health insurance must work in the country to improve their membership. Uh, in a country where the informal sector is about 60% of the economy. If it is the formal sector, usually it's covered. The employer-employee relationship, it's part of, uh, the insurance system will be part of their scheme. But the informal sector, it is quite challenging. And of course, there are certain countries in the world 
uh, who can uh, outreach to the informal sector. And this is something that, uh, that will be very, very helpful for the international organization to outreach and to communicate and to share knowledge from uh, international best practices in outreaching the informal sector in the economy for the health insurance. The other thing that is also very important in the case of Indonesia because of the geography and the size is the relationship between the central and the local government. The, the more clearer the uh, divisions of responsibilities, the better, right from the beginning. Because this is, uh, sometimes it can be very, it can become like a uh, moral hazard. Local governments would like their uh, population to be part of the government program as much as possible. But uh, when it comes to the who should pay the uh, premiums, everyone is looking at the central government or the Ministry of Finance. Thanks, Hani. Well, thank you for touching on uh, two very important policy perspectives. One is the, you know, the question of covering the informal sector and the need for different innovations and policy tools. And uh, if people are not documented, how, how do you actually cover them? I mean, how, how does, even if a government is committed to social health insurance, you are constrained in your ability to make a per capita contribution on their behalf. So I think we'll park that question for as one of the research and research questions for, for, for the bank and WHO to take back in the end. And secondly, I thought that one of the profound points that you touched upon was the different tiers of government and the prerogatives and the fiscal commitments that come into play when designing an insurance system. I mean, there are 36 federations in the world uh, where central governments and provincial governments have completely different sovereign mandates. Uh, and the institutionalization of an insurance program is very, very tricky there. So thank you for, uh, for outlining these points. Um, I want to come back to you, um, uh, Mr. Nazara, and then, and then to you, uh, Minister Eduale, j just, to, just a heads up. We heard about the catalytic commitment. You know, we heard about the 3.9 billion, uh, and I would like to call it catalytic commitment. Uh, because ultimately it's the responsibility of sovereign governments to commit long-term fiscal resources towards universal health coverage. Do you, do you see that happening in your country? Very short answers from Nigeria and Indonesia. The, the, the answer is yes for Nigeria. Um, That's so an admirable answer. Round, <laughs> round of applause. And from Indonesia? Yes, certainly. The mandate for the universal health coverage by 2019 is still there. Excellent. Sometimes, as they say, less is more. A few words convey more meaning than, than a long speech. Ingrid, we know that there's catalytic money in the pipeline, thanks to Japan. We know that some of the largest countries in the world, Indonesia and Nigeria, one of the mega countries in the world, are committing long term to universal health coverage. Um, how do you supplement this in, with innovative financing? We, we've heard President Jim Kim this morning that the financing system is broken, that business as usual is not an option. Give us your ADB perspective on where innovations in financing are happening and where you would like to catalyze more work and thinking around that. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, th there are different parts within the supply chain and within the universal health coverage that needs to be addressed. One of them is the, uh, the contribution for the out-of-pocket expenses. When they are too high, it could lead to catastrophic or impoverishing health care expenditure. So we need to look at ways to reduce those by prepayments and a higher contribution from the government itself. Now the government might not always be able to fit that bill. So they might use or might need to use the private sector. There are different ways of doing this. So partly the government itself could reinsure itself or insurances could come in and pay part of the burden. That can be done by using PPP mechanisms. Now we're working on using these PPP mechanisms for these, but it's still early days. But that's one of the ways we could foresee innovations. The other part is the quality of the supply chain of hospitals and other medical services. In a lot of countries, these, um, these facilities need to be upgraded or they need to be expanded. 
Again, the burden of the cost of these expansions cannot be borne by the governments alone. Ways of doing this is, is again, PPP structures to put in place with government to finance this infrastructure. Um, the other things we are doing is using technical, uh, technical assistance to provide the, the government with capacity to improve the hospitals and improve the efficiencies of the care that is provided. And last but not least, um, ADB is active in a broad range of sectors in a particular country. And what we have already heard from different panelists and different speakers today, healthcare provision is not just the task of the healthcare department. It goes across a lot of sectors and across a lot of ministries in the government. Within ADB, it also grows across a lot of departments. You could think about infrastructure, you could think about banking and finance to cover the insurance, but also the ministries of health. And that's something that ADB can foster by our cross-sectoral experience and connections. Ingrid, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but are, are there any best practice examples in countries that you would like to just outline one, two, three? Well, the, 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 we have some early successes with, pro with providing technical assistance to Palau and Mongolia for the healthcare coverage, where the efficiencies actually um, resulted in additional uh, in additional um, coverage. Um, the other examples I might want to share with you, we have a project in the, great, in the greater Mekong sub-region where we're working on a regional initiative. Some of the uh, issues we have are not just national, but they are regional. So we're providing loans to Laos, Mongol no, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Cambodia to work together on signaling systems and early warning systems. Okay, so that is how you're integrating universal health coverage objectives with the pandemic preparedness objectives. Is, is that a correct understanding? Th that's correct, thank well, you. Well, well, I think that's, that's a very important way of exploiting a synergy and congratulations for that. I'm assuming you're working closely with the World Health Organization. Um, yes, we do, of course. Excellent. So I think that's, that's a good segue to, uh, to something else which I think needs to be part of this discourse, which is emergency preparedness and you know, to address the risk of a pandemic. Because there are very few risks that threaten to wipe out the development gains of the last century and you know, the threat of a pandemic is certainly one of them. Now I know Mercedes, you have um, you know, horizontal, vertical depth of experience in uh, dealing with humanitarian emergencies in one of the most complex settings in the world. I know that MSF has come out with a report yesterday uh, on the subject, you know, into looking at emergencies from the UHC lens. C can you give us your perspective on how you see pandemic preparedness being integrated with UHC? Yes. Uh First of all, thank you for inviting MSF uh, uh, to be part of this panel. And um, I believe, uh, strongly believe, uh, that is really as, as doers, as uh, frontline uh, responders, that uh, we, uh, we have an obligation to, to share with you the, the reality check. This is what we can contribute uh, for um, to this uh, progress uh, towards, uh, towards uh, UHC. Um, when, when, uh, when, when thinking of uh, emergency response, um, and we um, certainly um, uh, identify user fees, uh, which, uh, by the way, is a pretty old-fashioned um, step backwards, uh, um, as uh, really not encouraging at all for population to come uh, to come uh, upfront, uh, being sick and therefore delaying their response. This is something that we saw and happened during the Ebola outbreak in 2014 and 2015, uh, where sick people uh, could not, uh, will not uh, uh, go to seek for healthcare because uh, uh, they were to, to pay for treatment. On the contrary, during the last uh, Ebola outbreak in, uh, in DRC in, uh, 
in Litaki. Um, the Ministry of Health immediately uh, proposed uh, free health care, and that uh, multiplied uh, the cases, therefore uh, being in a, in a better, in a better uh, position to, to respond. I would like, when we speak about uh, pandemic response, and I feel obliged uh, to, um, uh, to share with you that uh, it is also about uh, responding to epidemics at hand. It is, it is, uh, it is, uh, it is about neglected epidemics uh, as well. Uh, today we are we are facing a diphtheria out, outbreak uh, in uh, Rohingya refugee children in Bangladesh. Um, we have uh, repeated. Uh, uh, missiles and cholera outbreaks in uh, in DRC that go unnoticed. Uh, so we uh, we really call upon uh, paying attention to that and not only uh, uh, working on a basis of uh, potential risk. And then let me just uh, share a word with you on the um, on the uh, global health security agenda. And uh, I just uh, throw the question. Uh, uh, here, uh, whose, whose health uh, we are talking about? Uh, who is a threat? Um, who is the one deciding uh, what's, uh, what's the health threat, uh, right? And, uh, and this is something that uh, I really believe it has, uh, it has to be uh, on the table. Last but not least, any emergency response, any response to outbreaks, uh, whether epidemics or pandemics, uh, they uh, really have to have the community at the very heart of their response. Without community involvement and participation, without community systems uh, uh, to respond, uh, there will be nothing that will happen. And for UHC as well, if, uh, I mean, they are the game changers. They, uh, the community is the game changer. So uh, that's what we have to share with you. Thank you, Mercedes. This, so there, there clearly is a shared agenda. U, UHC is not just about uh, you know, human security, and it's not just about economic objectives and resilience and all that. It's also about protecting us against the next pandemic. Let, let me draw you in, um, Mr. Shiozaki, on, on this particular subject. Because as a Minister of Health, Labor, and Welfare of the Government of Japan for several years, you shepherded Tecard 6, and you uh, spearheaded the Ishishima, the health component of the Ishishima Summit. Uh, and you really pushed uh, the glo strengthening, the agenda of strengthening the global health architecture for uh, public health emergencies. Uh, what do you think of the recent progress uh, on that, and how do you think Japan links this with universal health coverage? Well, first of all, after uh, Ebola outbreak in 2014, I think there was a, some confusion about what to do with the uh, global health architecture in, in emergency cases. But uh, uh, we were uh, fortunate enough to be a presidency president of uh, G7, G7, and the Ishishima Summit was a good occasion for G7 and uh, related organizations to come up with the uh, uh, basic uh, uh, consensus about uh, what to do uh, when in the, in the uh, real emergency case in terms of uh, architecture for health emergency. And uh, uh, I, I think what worries me is now that uh, uh, since three years has so, have already passed after the Ebola outbreak, I hope uh, uh, the attention, global attention towards these uh, possible emergency uh, should not be diminished and uh, should keep in, always in mind that any time we, we're going to face emergency again. And, but we do have uh, two facilities in WHO and also uh, World Bank. But uh, I think we always have to be, in, in, well, or keep in mind that uh, financial uh, readiness is already, always be kept. Uh, and in that sense, I, I, I think we are proud that our Prime Minister made uh, 2.9 uh, additional uh, contribution to that. And related to the, the, the uh, uh, new architecture, 
I think we have depicted the specific uh, procedures to uh, how to uh, respond in, in, a, in each uh, organization and uh, sta with standard operation procedures. And I, I think simulation has been taking place and uh, I think it's good to keep uh, simulating uh, just for, uh, in the case of uh, emergency, uh, you don't know when it happens. Uh, Ingrid, are you providing any specific country support for unifying pandemic preparedness and uh, UHC policy? Yes, we are. That's basically building on building on the example I just gave for the uh, Greater Mekong, uh, Greater Mekong subregion. That's where we are providing support to build up an early warning and monitoring system for the impact, so that the um, the pandemics when they arise can spot it early and contained earlier. And given it's a regional phenomenon, then the countries who have more experience can work with the less experienced countries and still contain the area. Although the systems might be, although the, the level, the early capacity might differ. And I'm assuming that when you talked about innovative financing earlier and you know the potential of mobilizing different public-private partnership tools for that, you were talking about both these objectives and not just universal health coverage. Is that the case? The, these um, a public private partnership can apply it in various areas and in various in it, it depends on how you how broad you define universal health care if you talk about hospitals if you talk about sewage systems and sanitations which is not directly universal health care but it's one of the standard building blocks for health we can provide such tools across the whole range but certainly hospitals and infrastructure and sewage are, are essential to universal health coverage because, because universal health coverage builds on that. Mr. Nazara, would you, uh, would, do you want to, to comment on how to integrate universal health coverage and pandemic preparedness in your country? Uh, well, the uh, Indonesian laws uh, mandates that uh, we have to spend annually 5% of the annual budget on health. And that covers the uh, uh, premiums for the poor and also covers the family planning. That can also cover the pandemic uh, uh, preparation if necessary. And that also the supply side of the health services. So uh, we manage that. But of course, in the, in the event that is an uh, outbreak of a severe uh, situation, then the, 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 the budget can, uh, can top up uh, the amount that is needed. Uh, this is where the, but of course the national health insurance is going to be like a, the first uh, sort of line of uh, defense in uh, responding directly to the needs of the people. Well, that's a very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, I want to come back to you, um, Mr. Shiozaki. Uh, and the reason why I come back to you again and again is because Japan has been so much at the front, forefront of both universal health coverage as well as pandemic preparedness, and some of your outreach initiatives, your development initiatives, which go beyond the fiscal envelope. And again, referring to TICAD 6 and the, the G7 Ishishima initiative and the ASEAN Japan Health Ministers meeting held, uh, held this year. I mean, can you share your thoughts on the significance of these initiatives uh, for countries that are, uh, that are preparing uh, on, the, on the policy side, I mean, it is certainly beyond, m much further beyond money. It's also about technical ins assistance and hand-holding and ins inspiring and getting them to graduate above a certain level. Well, uh, well at the outset, I, as I said, uh, uh, we do have uh, uh, universal health coverage ever since uh, 1961. But uh, uh, what we have been telling other countries, uh, you know, achieving to uh, uh, well get the universal health coverage in each individual country, is that uh, it, it, it's not just a financial scheme that uh, uh, you know covers everything. And uh, uh, since we have demographic problems of aging and decreasing population and decreasing labor forces and few babies. And th this really uh, distorts the population pyramid. And that means 
the hardship for social security sustainability. So uh, I think th there are many false uh, uh, um, challenges that uh, we have to uh, face in terms of uh, uh, keeping universal health coverage as functionable as possible and that would uh, make everybody healthy and happy and also give ground for uh, social stability and also the uh, uh, economic growth. So uh, maintaining or maintenance of uh, uh, universal health coverage is very important for us and it's not that easy uh, for us either because of the uh, 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 political uh, uh, debate that would uh, um, easily come out from the uh, uh, how, who, how and who is going to bear the burden of the uh, premiums and also the, the level of co-payments. So I think uh, um, it's very important to achieve UHC, but at the same time, the maintenance is also very important. That's the, the way we talk to uh, other countries. Well, that's a great answer. I mean, clearly, universal health coverage is a very political process. Uh, but it is the long-term policy continuity that really does the thing. I mean, different governments can tinker at the margins and make changes, but they, they should not veer from, the, from course. And that, I think that's one of the key messages that we ought to take away from, uh, from, from this panel and from this conference in general. Uh, Mercedes, we, we know it's a political process. We know that it's governments that have to commit. And, but, but how does the civil society hold governments to account? And, uh, I, I refer th th this question to you in particular in the context of the report that you launched yesterday uh, and, and some of the key messages that the civil society will continue to hammer uh, as governments change in sovereign environments. Can, can you elaborate on that a little? Absolutely. Uh, so the report that we, uh, we uh, issued uh, is, uh, is uh, questioning the user fees uh, and I think you, some of you might, uh, might have got it. Um, what the, for, for the community, uh, let me give you, give you put a face uh, on, uh, on situations I've, uh, I've gone through as a, I'm an infectious diseases uh, clinician and I've been working in, uh, in Kenya, in Homa Bay, in an area where, where you have the highest uh, prevalence of HIV infection in the world. And, uh, and patients uh, were dying from AIDS, arriving to the hospital that late because they could not afford uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to pay for hospital fees or for spe specialized care and complementary tests uh, they needed. Uh, that, it, that's, that's outraging. That's, uh, that's something that uh, uh, should not happen. So in this health for all, you have to make sure that uh, the most vulnerable, the most in need, are really captured under the umbrella. And we know that this is a very difficult exercise, but it's, about, uh, it's, it's, it's up to decision makers to set uh, priorities. And, uh, and again, uh, a narrow-sighted uh, security lens uh, and uh, a financial logic of uh, return uh, on investment should not take the most vulnerable hostage uh, of it. And this is where I really call upon, and, and uh, my colleagues of uh, civil society uh, would agree, uh, we call upon this uh, too big to fail, uh, amazing, powerful UHC uh, uh, leadership uh, to uh, keep that in mind, uh, to. Uh, uh, to, to, to integrate uh, the, uh, the community, as I mentioned, and the civil society in such a way that we can contribute to the accountability that is not um, only among donors, states, uh, is first of all towards the patient, towards the population. So here's where we will be, that's for sure. And uh, I know that MSF uh, sometimes is not that reliable, but for that one, uh, you can rely upon us. Thank you. 
Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mercedes. I think that, that's a great note to end the panel on, you know, reminding the audience that universal health coverage is not about return on investments. I mean, that is a corollary. That, that is an additional argument that you, you can make in support of what you're saying. But ultimately, it is the right to health that's important. It is the moral argument that should guide our decision making and that of governments. And that the economic um, benefits are, are important, but they're secondary. But that should not be the primary motivation uh, to invest in universal health coverage and in, in human development. Um, I just want to um, end by thanking all of you. Um, I, just, I don't even want to summarize what has been a very rich and insightful discussion. Um, I just want to end by saying that there are some key takeaways from this panel. Number one, that progress is slow. It is abysmally slow, and that, uh, that is not acceptable. That is simply not acceptable. Secondly, that we have to think out of the box, um, and that there are a number of things that have to happen in tandem. Universal health coverage is, of course, about political commitment. Of course, it is about investments fiscally. Uh, but then it is also about the capacity to cascade that political will and the fiscal envelope into implementation. It's about improving water and sanitation systems. It is about having new financing instruments. It is ex about expanding geographic coverage and in environments such as the ones I come from, where 80% of the service provision is by the private sector, it will entail a whole new paradigm of capacity on behalf of governments and the outreach and the leveraging of the private sector that they have to institutionalize. Universal health coverage is also about improving, the, improving supply chains and about um, new information systems and about institutionalization of non-communicable diseases. I have to say it because I'm the new commission co-chair uh, and I fundamentally believe that we have to broaden our lens of disease and think about these new global killers that are, uh, that are kill killing millions around the world. So, so universal health coverage is about a range of things at different levels. And I just want to go back to something very profound and fundamental, which Mr. Shiozaki said, about learning from failures. I think there was an enormous modesty and self-effacing character of, uh, of a Japanese who said it. But then behind that was something very scientific. That when you put a reform in place, when you put a policy in place, you don't, do not think that it will fly on its own. You plow back learnings to refine it. And unless you have that long-term commitment to do that, you will not succeed. Policy initiatives such as universal health coverage uh, is not about a one-time one fix that a government will do. It is about a nation's promise to its people. It is something that has to be insulated from government change over a long period of time. New governments every five years can continue to tinker at the margin, can continue to make tactical changes. But once an initiative is in place, it has to be carried through over decades. And I think the trick is in ensuring that that will happen. And some of the remarks that Jim Kim made this morning about pegging that commitment in fiscal and monetary and structural tools, I think is really going to be a game changer there. So I just want to end by saying that the, the broader global framework has also made it easier to go to espouse such changes. Because in the era of the Millennium Development Goals, the world focused on vertical targets and time-bound outcome-based commitments, and we had a disease focus, and the, the, the world had fiscal space, and the G8 donors would come to the developing countries to handhold. Uh, but the world is very different in the era of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, the, the, the thinking is to focus on strengthening countries, systems, and processes so that the international system can focus on where they have a comparative advantage, and that is just the right way to go. We today know that tax evasion is not, does not just fuel money laundering and terrorist financing, but it also takes uh, the precious res domestic resources away 
um, from initiatives such as universal health coverage. So there is a huge synergy to be exploited between what is happening broadly at the global level and between the things that we as um, you know, technical students in the domain of health aspire for. I want to thank you all for being with us. My apologies for not opening the floor for questions. That was, I was told that was not the format. Please reach out to our panelists at the coffee break and thank you for being with us. Thank you for that very interesting discussion. And we have to cut the, sh the coffee break short. So please be back by 12.15 for the next panel. Uh, coffee break is in Sunflower Room. And please visit the Innovation Showcase while you're there. Thank you.